Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, we're gathered here today to celebrate a wonderful new arrival. Um, it's Go 1.8. Woo! Um, so first of all, this is a uh, Creative Commons license. Uh, Dave Cheney wrote most of the slides here. Um, so I'll, I'll be presenting. I've added my own kind of modifications for interest of time, et cetera, and highlights. Um, but yeah, um, Go on 8 uh, released today. That's, that's the current date. Um, it's the ninth, ninth release. Um, following this, uh, there's a link to the release notes. Um, so what's changed? Uh, performance. Compiler changes, runtime changes, standard library. Um, so we'll kind of go through that order. Um, performance has actually been really big in the Go 1.8 release cycle. Um, there's the usual kind of disclaimer of performance is one of those notable things that's hard to measure, etc. We can make all sorts of claims on benchmarks and sorts of things, but you should really measure on your own application. But hopefully, things should be better. Um, in particular, the garbage collector. Um, it has uh, significantly shorter. Um, it can go all the way down to as low as 10 microseconds, um, you know, usually under 100. Um, this is an order of magnitude improvement where before um, we were targeting, you know, 10 millisecond pauses. Um, so much shorter large collection cycles. Um, defer is faster. Uh, C go is faster. Um, thanks. Uh, um, and performance improvements all throughout standard library packages here. Um, Wait, can uh, you go back one? Yeah, absolutely. So many. <laughs> Text templates, training Perfect. Cisco, all these things. Um, compiler changes. Um, so, uh, in, in this release cycle, um, Go's compiler has converted to a uh, SSA um, single static, single, yeah. Um, uh, so this new form allows um, a number of optimi optimizations um, and uh, code forms. Um, the old, you know, Plan 9 style has been kind of phased out. Um, and this used to only just be on the AMD64 code gen. It's now across all the different um, code gen backends. Um, and it, it makes it easy to add new SSA backends, again, for values um, that if you like writing compilers, it's easier. Um, the parser has also gone on you know, significant changes as well. Um, there's no more global mutable state. Hooray! Um, and you know, and talking with the folks that uh, have been using this, that it is actually a lot easier to debug, and there's been all sorts of wonderful, fun things that were like, hey, wait, in this weird one condition, uh, the parser could you know, do this sort of thing. Um, so much simpler now. Um, so yeah, compile speeds um, about a 12-15 percent improvement compared to Go 1.7. So we're we're still trying to get back to the um, Go 1.4 sort of metrics that are there, but we're steadily making uh, progress release over release. Um, I think this, this might be a little old. This is a develop branch. I'm not sure if somebody's rewritten this graph. Um, lots of ports. Um, you can get Go on um, many different places now. 32-bit um, MIPS on Linux. Um, Dragonfly BSD, OpenBSD, um, the networking support for Plan 9. Who uses the Plan 9 port? Is there anybody in the screen? <laughs> Ooh, yay, cool! <laughs> Congratulations! You get better networking support now. There you go. Um, so yeah, uh, deadlines, cancellation. Right. Um, all there. Um, and yeah, the traditional uh, Mac, you know, OS X, keeping up with the latest. Um, Go and 8 may be the last to support on V5. There's general kind of lack of um, support. Um, if you or your company cares about ARMv5, you should contact Brad up here in Pro. Um, so, there you go. Uh, we're also starting to get some more exciting kind of build compile time features. Um, we've got plugins. Um, it's kind of still an experimental sort of thing. It only works on Linux um, at the time, but this is kind of a first big shift from having 
you know, big statically compiled binaries, being able to break that up into dynamically linked plugins. Um, another uh, kind of uh, compile um, change here is that now uh, if you have, for instance, let's see, you have a, yeah, got a laser pointer here. Um, between two structs, um, if you want to be able to just change between tags and the rest of the type is identical, um, you can now do a type conversion instead of having to write out the whole thing yourself. Um, and there's default code path. Um, for anybody who's ever been confused as, yeah, let's hear about the default code path. Woo! Yay! Um, so yeah, when GoPath is not defined, it'll use uh, this home Go on any sort of unix flavor thing. It'll use your profile Go on Windows, so uh, you don't have to worry about you know doing GoPath before you do Go get. Um, much easier for you know, getting everything started on a new workstation. That's your That's would make it more complicated. Yes, if your Go root is your uh, home Go. Um, Cool. So, couple, couple big runtime. You know, as always, there's a number of, you know, runtime changes between each Go release. Um, I'll talk about a few here. Um, there's now detection of concurrent map accesses um, for, you know, being able to do race detection. So, um, the race detector now supports a lot more of these cases than it did before. Uh, there's also now a mutex contention profiling um, way. There's a couple caveats with how this is. This will be addressed early in the next release cycle. Um, but uh, you can see, um, you can do profiling of how much, you know, two mutexes are fighting between threads, how long they're blocked um, on each of these things. Um, so really useful for when you're going to look at performance stuff. So keep watching this space. There will be more fun things to come. Um, we got some fun changes to the standard library. Um, we have sort.slice now. Um, so if you've ever had to keep rewriting those same three lines of uh, when each of those methods, um, it, you can trade off a little bit of performance and get source on slice. It is faster now? Oh. It's faster than the normal way. Ooh, all right. We got Brad saying it's faster. Excellent. Love it. Um, so OS executable um, is another wonderful function um, for those of you who you know really want to be able to get the OS RB in a nice, sane, platform-independent way. This is the lifesaver, um, and you know there's some caveats on usage, but in general it abstracts over all the nasty things that you don't want to have to do. Um, and HTTP shutdown, long requested. Um, you can now actually gracefully shut down an HTTP server. Um, you can give it a timeout for how long you want to spend before all the requests unceremoniously get booted out, um, or you can remove that deadline, what have you. Um, so this allows you to you know, have HTTP servers come up and down. Um, you can now push things in HTTP2. Um, so you've got this nice pusher interface, response writer um, implements it. Um, so if you have an HTTP2 front end that you're wanting to push resources for, um, you know, it's, this now works. Um, we've plumbed more context in more places. Um, so uh, since Go on 7, we have uh, net and HTTP OS exit. Um, HTTP server shutdown, you see on the last couple of slides. Um, that also takes it in for um, context uh, cancellation for being able to do deadlines. Um, database SQL drivers now accept this as well, so um, drivers will be able to get cancellation of um, net, net .result. Um So yeah, that's kind of the whirlwind tour. Um, I encourage you to, you know, if um, any of the things in particular kind of um, jump out at you, read the release notes, um, download it, um, start compiling um, and using it with your server already. Um, but let's take a look ahead of um, what we're going to see in the next six months. Uh, and, you know, with the usual caveat, all this is speculation, nothing's set in stone until things actually happen. Um, one of the big language features um, that's uh, being proposed um, and is now being prototyped and tested um, is type aliases. Um, it's now a much more limited proposal than it was before. It used to be just aliases in general. Um, we're now examining uh, type aliases, just restricted type aliases, 
prototyping and um, that's, I believe, that's already in master, I think. Yeah. Um, so uh, look forward to that if you want to be able to migrate types between packages. Um, faster, cheaper runtime mem stats. Uh, so this is a runtime uh, change where um, if you're in production, service environment, you want to be able to you know, get this information. Um, it's been proportional to the size of the heap. Um, it's uh, now per thread, um, and that is actually thread, that's not go routine. Um, it's actual executing thread operating system on thread. Um, and that should be a much smaller upper bound. Um, uh, the improvements to the inliner also coming. Um, so there's um, been a number of things of making sure that we can still do inlining safely, but also being able to get nice line numbers for stack traces, etc. Um, there's work being done to look at this and also improving the cost model so that more things can get in line when they properly need it. And uh, there's also um, uh, Ian's uh, put out a, um, you know, been working with the network polar in general. Um, and uh, this has been extended. Um, for those kind of background here, um, part of the reason why Go is very efficient is because uh, when uh, it goes to block on a system call, like being able to read or write to a network socket, um, that instead of actually blocking on that syscall, it automatically puts it into ePoll or KQ or whatever. Um, this is also something that can happen for file descriptors, but it traditionally hasn't. So if you try to do a lot of reads, writes from file descriptors that aren't network sockets, um, it, you know, it requires kind of some handshaking with runtime. So this should hopefully mean that more of those things should not take as many operating system threads um, and better performance. Um, and uh, the long-awaited, um, the magical, the official dependency management tool. Um, so this is already, um, you can check this out now, um, available at github.com, golang, dep. Um, it's very pre-alpha, um, but if you haven't already seen it, you should check it out. Um, file bugs, they're you know, looking for all that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, um, very similar to Glide, Go Vendor, I've been trying out for the last couple weeks, and it's actually pretty cool. So cool. Um, in, in conclusion, um, you should upgrade to Go 1.8 right now. It's literally the best version of Go ever. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see. Uh, questions? Hey, could you go back to the, the, the comment about pinlining? Uh, sure. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar enough with that. Does it do it recursively? So for example, if A calls B calls C, uh -huh. if C is in line, and now B is also short, would it then recursively? Ah, I see. Um, so the question is, um, uh, is the inlining recursive? Um, I believe that that's, I'm, I'm trying to think about that. I think that it is, so you're asking if um, A calls B calls C, um, C gets in line, A gets in line? Or so, I, I'm sorry, it's, it isn't a 128 question, it's kind of a go. Oh, sure, question. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's say C is very small. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, well, I guess C would always be, be there. So yeah. your question is uh, could C then be inlined into the body of B? Upon so doing, mm -hmm. it may be the body of B is now also quite small. Uh, yes, I'm not sure whether our, I. I I'm not sure off the cuff without looking at the compiler code whether um, that's something that happens right now in the cost model. I believe that it doesn't. I think that it only does one level of. Yeah, I think once there's any function call, like. Yeah, as soon as it. Wrong. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, I think it is. As soon as you hit a function call, it becomes complex enough. I think it's because of the line um, number information. Yeah, I think that, that almost has to be. Basically, it, it kind of it kind of sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but it was, like, but it was like a major performance win. We added it, yeah. even though it sucked. But it's, it's very immature. Yeah. Um, well, Windows guys might remember the first time they, they had identical combat folding, and the symbols were for some completely different function. You know what I'm saying about that? Function foo and function bar. No, it's, it isn't worth pursuing. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs>
Yeah, so I think, um, uh, so the question is, um, why can't you do comma OK um, as an idiom for when you call a uh, closed channel? Um, I think, so in general, close is used to indicate that that's a condition that's happened, um, and that if you have multiple, um, if, if you're already asking that question, um, and you're trying to write code that is asking that question, it can necessarily be racy, because usually the reason that you're asking for that is, hey, um, if the channel's still open, should I send? But there's an implicit, um, you're missing a synchronization point there, because if you, if you check for is it open, and then you send something there, somebody could have closed it in the time between those two things. Um, so in general, just in thinking about it, I think that for the design, you would want to have synchronization elsewhere to ensure that that, that works that way. Yeah, I, we have some cases where it doesn't matter. Like we don't care if it's a little bit off and it stops slower than we want it to, or it doesn't exactly stop when the channel's closed. It'd be nice to have it. But. Sure, yeah. Is that the same school of thought as, well, some range conditions are okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hyper faster again. Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll do. So there's a question here, Russ. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll field the question first before trying to. Does the uh, does the uh, HTTP graceful shutdown thing send uh, a go away frame for HTTP two servers? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I have it on good faith here. <laughs> services that you want to talk to. Google creates, you know, for instance, a hosting um, environment on cloud where, um, you know, there are libraries, you need to be able to talk to these services, etc. Um, but creating libraries is actually something that's a rather infrequent thing. If you have a bug or an API compatibility sort of concern or something, there's usually already an existing library for this, and it's more of a case of if you were to write a new package, you now have 15 competing standards where you had 14 before, so you don't really want to be creating new libraries every single time. So more often than not, I maintain libraries. Maybe, this is actually probably closer to the truth. Um, more often than not, what happens is we get a whole bunch of different bug reports where people are using things on cloud or one of the libraries, and they we start to see over time, hey, there's a really easy way that you can hold this library wrong. Um, and that usually means there's some way that you can lop off your own foot. You don't want that to happen. And so that's, you're like, man, it'd be really great if this 
we could keep this existing library, we don't want to create a new one, but we really want to be able to fix everybody who's using it over time and make it much more reliable. Um, so this is, you know, a, a go talk um, kind of focus, so I'll kind of show you in concrete what I mean. So let's say um, here on the left, I've got a library that, you know, this is obviously a very fictitious library. It's not very well written because if you're storing names this way, you, you shouldn't. Don't, please don't. Um, there's all sorts of more complicated names that you can have in here, but we'll say that we are. Um, so this is a library we maintain. We write a function, um, and some applications using this function um, have a function that for some reason calls over to ours, but returns as a great speaker. They have a unit test on their side um, where they have a person, and then they check for reflect.dequal and say, OK, uh, this has the expected values that are there. Who's written a test like this? We've got one. We've got, good, good. You, you all should have written a test like this at some point that you've checked for something being equal to something else. If you haven't, if you write more tests, tests are good. Um, so, um, let's say here on this left side, um, the library changes somewhat. We're now storing something else in our data store. Um, a favorite number, for instance. And now this function, that's this underlying function, um, has a field here that I, I want to add. Again, I'm a maintainer here to this library and I'm just adding something. When I go to run this and I start running all the tests for all the applications that use this library, I see this weird breakage and it's coming from you know, this app over here on the right. And when I really drill down into it, the offending line is this reflect.db equal line. What reflect.db equal does is constrains your test of that now um, in this literal, because we didn't specify favorite number, it's assuming zero. And we're now comparing between this and this, and it now has zero to 42. So that's not going to work. So what I'm here to talk to you about today is um, what do I really do? I fight bad tests. <laughs> and there's a lot of them. And there's probably, over the course of your career, you've probably heard a lot of people say, hey, you should write tests. You should write more tests. Writing tests is really good and really improves your code quality. I'm here today to, I'm not going to tell you that you should write more tests. I'm telling you you should stop writing bad tests because bad tests actually have real costs and this is mostly what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so lessons from doing this, and this is kind of where I'm going to start going to more general lessons that I've learned and kind of go specific tips that I've, um, that I've seen. Um, so please don't use reflect.db equal is the, the first one here. And you may think, well, wait, reflect.db equal is really useful. Um, and it saves me a lot of code. I mean, I didn't have to check for those two fields. Well, I coming in trying to check in a library, I'm making just a simple change if I'm adding a field. That shouldn't have broken your application. And I don't know that it didn't. Maybe you do actually depend on the fact that a person only has a first name and a last name field. Um, but I need to be able to add fields over time because that's a compatibility contract. I need to be able to add more fields and store more things over time. Um, so can, over constraining your tests doesn't allow me to maintain and fix library things that are bugs. This is a more controversial one. Please don't use encoding GOP. I, it, it has its, its merits and uses, but I've far more often seen it um, used in very bad places. Um, and the big thing for those who haven't used GOB, it depends on the field ordering and also which field. There's a number of things about field type and everything. Um, but the main one is that it depends on order. Um, as a real life anecdote, um, I was once fixing a library um, and we happened to have reordered the fields in our library should not have actually changed any symbolic meaning anywhere in the program. As we were running tests for everything uh, across all the projects that we were interested in, uh, we get one test failure where, hey, this one giant blob of binary doesn't look like this other blob of binary. <laughs> okay, all right, what is this? As I start digging in, somebody was using an options 
um, struct, one that was a totally temporary wire sort of thing that you would use to pass into as a parameter to another function, never intended to actually be directly used for wire serialization, and they were serializing that as a pagination token. So now it's like, okay, everybody on the planet now has, is depending on the exact field order of this struct that was buried away in a library. Please don't use gob, especially don't use it on structs you don't know. I can't add or reorder fields if you do this. Another interesting one is please, in your unit tests, never actually check error. And if you have to, if you really think that you have to, please use strings.contains. I don't know how many times I've gone through and, hey, I want to add some more interesting error um, information where, um, let's say, um, I'll, I'll take an example from like the OS package, for instance. When you do os.open or, you know, you go to write to a file um, and there's an error, that usually contains the path name. But imagine for a moment if you had a version of the OS package that didn't have that file name and people were getting confused, the error message is, you know, really unclear. Um, so we want to, hey, well, nobody's really depending exactly on the error string, so I'm going to add in the path name everywhere. This has broken far, far more tests and actual production code than I care to admit. Um, really, if you're checking for this in a test, um, you should be doing strings.contains. You shouldn't directly check for the entire string. Because um, otherwise, I can't add more interesting information to an error message. Oops. <laughs> um, one other tendency that I've seen, this doesn't happen as much for seasoned Go programmers, but for ones that are newer, there's a tendency of, hey, I miss inheritance, I miss, you know, other things. I'm going to write things as interfaces, I'm not going to write structs. Um, it's harder to get an interface right than it is a struct, and it's also much harder to know how people are going to use an interface versus a struct. Um, if, you, if you write a struct, makes it easier to just know there's only one version of this and I can control that. Um, report bugs. Um, there's a rather interesting uh, a rather interesting episode a few months back. Um, without getting into too many specific details, we were talking with somebody on Slack. Um, somebody mentioned, hey, how do you do this one weird thing? And we all thought, that's odd. Why would you try to use those two GCP services together? All right, and then we kind of dug in with the user and was like, well, no, those don't quite work together. And the more that we got information as to why this user was trying to do this, um, they were like, oh, yeah, well, I can't log things out to the specific backend because it's really too slow and it only handles maybe half of the log entry per minute. It's like, oh, that's bad. Uh, that's a bug. You shouldn't be trying to combine two things together to work around something that clearly wasn't the way that it was supposed to work from a performance standpoint. And as a library maintainer, you don't get to see those generally because you just, you write your library, you think it's correct, and you have some, you know, small scale tests, but usually the time at which something goes large, you've already given it to somebody else. So, I've kind of listed here, here's a bunch of patterns, here's a bunch of real world use cases of things that go wrong and things that I've had to deal with. Um, and um, I'll be happy to take questions at the end of you know, some of the particular lessons. But if you remember nothing else from this talk, I kind of want to go into deeper as to why does this sort of thing happen in software engineering. Um, so there's a wonderful bit of tidbit that I'm um, um, I'm going to read off here, but just to kind of give you, um, so Hiram Wright is a very smart Google software engineer who came up with um, this, you know, what's now been deemed Hiram's law inside of Google, and has written about this, um, that this is a very common sort of thing that when you're dealing with large code bases that you discover very quickly. Given enough use of some interface, some library, something that you're giving somebody else to use in their program, there is no such thing as a private implementation. 
That is, if an interface has enough consumers, they will collectively depend on every aspect of the implementation, whether they intend to or not. This effect serves to constrain changes to the implementation, which now must conform to both the explicitly documented interface, what I want you to be doing with the library, as well as the implicit interface captured by usage. We often refer to this phenomenon as bug-for-bug -bug compatibility, and this is not a good state that we want to be in. We don't want to get to the point where we're giving you a library where, yeah, we're going to ship it with this bug because somebody else was depending on this bug. It, I mean, I'm getting, getting a few laughs, but it's true. There's been times where people have argued that it's like, oh yeah, well, people have already been depending on this bug. Yeah, just keep the bug there. Everybody, everybody's already using it. Why fix it? Um, because if you just let this keep happening, you can't fix any bugs. You're so constrained that the only potential code that you can have is the same code that you started with. And thus you get 15 competing standards, which is not what I want to do. So, how you can reduce the stress of me or a library maintainer that you may or may not be working with. Um, only depend on the documented interface where possible. If you think that you need to be depending on more than that, you think that something, I don't know if I can depend on this in the library, ask. Don't depend on it first. And if you're writing tests, and you should be, everybody should be writing tests, um, I would argue that no test is better than a brittle test. If a test is depending on something, whether you intend to or not, that a library does and it's not documented, that's probably going to make your life harder as things go on. You, yes, you may be able to guarantee that things are exactly the way that it is, but you suffer for it and your libraries can't get updated. Um, and a way that you can get to the state is use fakes, don't use mocks. Don't assert for specific interactions, assert for the state that you want to have in the system. Um, and in general, if you find that this is hard to use for your test, um, it usually means either you need to write a new fake to be able to test that part, or you probably need to redesign the part if it's hard to test. That's it. Thanks. Questions? Questions? And yes, I welcome relish questions. I know some of the things I've said here are controversial. So your, your comment about um, checking for strings and errors. Yes. One of the things that Dave Cheney was talking about in his new error package was the ability to not lose the type error under the covers. Yes. Is there any chance that that's coming in to go officially? Or um, in the, um, let's see, are you saying in the standard library or? Yes. Okay. Um, there are no concrete plans at this time. Um, I would say that the, um, Dave's error package is, um, it's very good in being able to deal with that pattern. Um, I think there's some stack trace sort of stuff that's a little hard to work with sometimes, but the, the general wrapping semantics and everything that's there is actually really clean. Um, I don't think that there are plans, I really can't comment at this time, for official usage or official, um, official movement into there. But if it's something where people are more widely using that package and everybody really likes that package, who knows? Well, I guess I'm not necessarily saying that particular package, but having a method on error that allows you to look for a type in a, in a chain. Sure. Would, would allow us to then write tests without worrying about people augmenting the error. Absolutely. Um, at this point, um, yeah, it would be hard to make such a change. Um, again, as the you know, write structs, not interfaces, error is an interface at this point, so adding a method would be a um, go one incompatible change. Um, so, yeah, it, it's tricky. It's really tricky. Yes? So, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're, uh, the whole bug for bug compatibility. Yes. Uh, oh. Yeah, so bug for bug compatibility. 
mm -hmm. inside Google where you can submit a CL that actually covers the entire code base. Yes. It's easy to break stuff, run tests, fix it. How does yep. this work in the real world? That's a great question. Um, and it's definitely a hard one. Um, so it's for the libraries that we publish, I mean, we certainly, um, I'll, I'll give you my limited experience here um, in that uh, for working on the cloud libraries uh, for Google and Go, um, we, we do use Google Cloud Platform a fair amount internally, so there is actually a fair amount of, there is a corpus of code that has pretty good tests around it um, that we can see of, oh, hey, if we change this thing, this product over here breaks. Um, in, for distributing a general third-party library, uh, unless you have that sort of corpus, it's very hard. Um, I don't, in general, have a good suggestion for if you're distributing a third-party library, how, how can you make that sort of decision? Um, but I would say that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in most of this, of that if you think about ways that something could be abused at an API level, um, that usually goes a long way to making sure that people don't misuse it in a way that you don't expect, but it's hard. So I mean, so so two angles for that. So number one is um, how do you make sure you don't break consumers? Yeah. The other thing is you know you're going to break consumers, but you do it anyway. How do you mitigate that? Uh, and so I guess with the new dev stuff coming in, semantic versioning, like maybe mm -hmm. just decide to call it a major, even though you're not doing real breakage. Um, so hopefully, you know that'll that'll yeah. help. Um, I remember reading at one point, and I'm not totally up on this, that there was some proposal for essentially internal packages so that you could actually sort of keep the yes. the sort of interface. Now, is that, I, I, I think that was only for system packages, or at least, no, no, no. Um, or is this for everybody? Yeah, so for everybody, you can use, um, uh, so the feature here is that you can, um, inside of your repository, you can have a subdirectory, um, you just call it internal, and then, um, I think there's some trickiness in exactly how the semantics are here, but um, any sub-packages um, beyond that level are only accessible to the parents directories package and those below. Um, and yeah, that's definitely something where, um, yeah, being very thoughtful about uh, what you're choosing to export is a good way to be able to minimize that sort of risk. Question here? Or, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm not 100% confident, but I believe in Go 1 8, there's now. Can you um, question with microphone? Oh, yeah. So I believe in Go 1 to 8, uh, there's now the um, type equality between two types, uh, ignoring <coughs> the struct tags. Yes. And that also relies on the ordering of the uh, uh, yes. variables within your struct. Yes. Do you think that that's going to increase the sort of surface area of unintended dependencies in in between libraries? That's a good question. Um, I would hope not. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. I haven't thought that one all the way through. Um, I, yeah, I actually wasn't aware of that feature until a few weeks ago, actually. Um, I, I just heard about it in some of the, the release notes stuff. It's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, I have to give that one a bit more thought. Um, yeah, in general, I would hope that for those sort of things where you start depending on field ordering, um, it's probably fine to do it if you own both parts of the code, but you probably shouldn't be, it's kind of those, like, you can, but you shouldn't depend on somebody else's struct definition because they could change it at any time. Uh, I think we've got a question back there. Uh, uh, just a comment about the internal packages. Yeah. They would be useful if you could have several dependencies. Because if you have like package, for example, which defines some interface, and I have internal package with implementation, but then I need new method. 
and I want it in actually in the interface range, right? Not internal one. Oh, let's see. So the scenario is, is that you have you have a public interface, but you have a private implementation. Yeah. Uh, I found that when I tried to use them, they were useless because of, I couldn't do support dependency. And I want to only for oh, oh, okay. I see. Because you need like, because um, I was about to say, oh, well, but the interface doesn't need coupling. But this is probably like you have a couple of other internal. Uh, you have, for example, new function, right? Like how we create the instance of that. Right. Um, oh yes, because you need. Well, it kind of depends on how you do it. Because if you can I can create multiple of them, then I need to input more than one package. I'm saying it complicates things a lot, and it would be very nice to have support dependency for internal packages only. Right. So if you can do implicit interface satisfaction to be able to decouple the dependency. So if it's something where that interface could be implemented without depending on any um, like types at the the root of it, you could do it without introducing. Um, a type cycle, but if it's something where that interface requires um, having uh, having concrete types that you're also defining as part of the package and you want those to be public, yeah. So that was actually one of the, um, so we totally agree with you, um, is, the, is the good part there. Um, this is actually one of the lesser, um, lesser discussed part of the type aliases proposal that I'm actually fairly excited about is that you, um, you'd be able to break that, um, that dependency cycle by declaring the interface and the struct in the internal package and then aliasing it out in the public one. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So not just for moving things around. <laughs> Other questions? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, when you're maintaining libraries, how do you determine what's the minimum version of Go you support? And like move forward with newer code versions. Uh, that's another good question. Um, it very much depends on who um, who you're targeting, I'd say. Um, and in general, if you're supporting different versions of Go, I really do recommend running continuous integration for each of those particular Go versions. Um, it's really easy to accidentally break something only on one Go release. Um, uh, we actually had a, had to deal with a couple of those recently. The uh, somebody pushed out some code, and the the code itself was fine, but then the tests were using the new t dot run syntax inside of the unit tests. So then the continuous integration was just totally broken um, on pre go one seven um, stuff, and it was just nasty. Um, in in general, like. The version of Go that we're supporting is, you know, there, there's the release policy that's out, out there in Go. And most of the time we're, you know, we're assuming you're probably using the latest compiler. We realize that for the reality of it, it gets more messy and complicated. But in general, I think the sanest strategy is try to, try to stay clo as close to head as you possibly can. Do we have time for one more question, if we have any? Yes. Perfect now changes it to context, but it's difficult to mess with things in packages upstream and maybe having having run that and so forth. So um, yeah, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on whether it's appropriate to make those kinds of backward compatible changes in libraries if you can be fixed with the standard tooling. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I so I think it really does depend on what kind of library you're writing. Um, it, it it's funny because in um, in writing prose, writing you know uh, the written language, you always you know basic um, rhetoric classes will tell you, hey, you really got to consider your audience before you know you you write your paper, right? Um, in libraries, I think it's exactly the same thing. Uh, you really have to consider um, 
maybe if if you're writing a library for a very internal service and you know you own all the or own is not the right word. Um, you you know all the key stakeholders of people who are using your library and you can convert them over. Um, that may be a totally acceptable solution. If you're distributing it to the the world at large, um, uh, you can't generally depend on that sort of you know that sort of thing. Um, Xnet context is a great example. I um, and somebody was actually just asking me about this today. Uh, it's I think that Xnet context is going to be around for a long time because not only is it it's so pervasive. It's not just in libraries that we own, it's also in generated code and other sort of things for protobufs and gRPC sort of things. Um, type aliases will really help to be able to reduce the number of things that are breaking changes, but yeah, at a certain point, sometimes, sometimes you just need to decide, yeah, I'm going to rev it, do a major version. All right, thank you, Ross. Thanks.